Beginning in 1947, a high-stakes geopolitical game of chess kicked off between the United States and its superpower adversaries. These were China and the Soviet Union, aka the USSR. Although no direct battles were fought, a steady series of proxy wars, threats, and bickering all contributed to defining the Cold War. Following World War II, US President Harry S. Truman became hellbent on preventing the spread of communism. His policy took special priority in territories that he considered to be America's backyard, a concept open to the interpretation that harkened back to the Monroe Doctrine of 1823. Truman, having already dropped not one but two nukes on Japan, served notice to the world that given hell Harry could easily pull the trigger again. As a result, the nuclear age had dawned in which all the major powers now scrambled to stockpile bombs like nut-gathering squirrels on meth in a mad dash to control or obliterate the planet. Number 10. The Berlin Airlift as punishment for losing the war and ensuring that forever play the bad guys in every World War II movie, Germany also suffered the indignity of having its country divided and chopped up like a plate of bratwurst. These new boundaries created an early power struggle between the Soviets and their former allies in the West. Starting in the summer of 1948, Berlin became ground zero in a chaotic scene in which Soviet leader Joseph Stalin attempted to cut off all lands and water paths between West Berlin and West Germany. The air, however, was something the Russian strongman couldn't quite strangle with his bare hands, and thus began the Berlin Airlift. For the next 11 months, US and British planes provided West Berlin with 1.5 million tons of goods, landing an armada of aircraft day and night. The citizens of West Berlin received much-needed food and medical supplies, and above all, they received hope. Finally, on May 12, 1949, Stalin lifted the blockade, rather than risk the chance of shooting down the planes and starting World War III. This all proved to be a bit of an embarrassment for the Soviet Union, and it gave the United States an early lead in the ongoing cloak-and-dagger shenanigans for global domination. Nation. Number 9. Hungarian Uprising What started as a peaceful student protest against communist rule later erupted into violence and bloodshed on the streets of Budapest. But like many old European relationships, bad blood between Hungarians and Russians, it went back centuries. Further complicating matters, Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev had recently sent mixed signals encouraging Eastern Bloc nations to act more independently as part of the new, less repressive de-Stalinization policy. Taking this as a cue, Hungarian Prime Minister Imran Nagy called for an end to the country's one-party system, the total withdrawal of all Soviet troops, and planned to exit the Warsaw Pact, the Soviet version of NATO. Khrushchev's concept of freedom it sort of got lost in translation and in the early morning hours of November 4, 1956, over a 1,000 Soviet tanks and 150,000 troops poured into the Hungarian capital. Nagy desperately appealed to the West for help, but with the Suez crisis unfolding at the same time and President Eisenhower running for re-election, the Americans decided to send good old thoughts and prayers instead. By the time the smoke had cleared, 2,500 locals had been killed and another 200,000 fled the country as refugees. Nagy would later be convicted and hanged, transmitting a message loud and clear that any attempt to slip through the Iron Curtain would not be tolerated. Number 8. U2 Incident Just feel we should disclaim it that this has nothing to do with either the superstar rock band from Dublin or the stealth German submarines. Sorry to disappoint you there. On May 1, 1960, the Soviet Union shot down an American spy plane piloted by Francis Gary Powers, who had been engaged in a covert mission as part of the CIA's U-2 program. The Kremlin considered the intrusion as an aggressive act and blasted the aircraft with surface-to-air missiles near the industrial city of Yekaterinburg. Immediately following the incident, officials in Washington, D.C. went into damage control mode, spinning a yarn that Powers was simply uh, in the neighborhood taking pictures of clouds in a weather plane, maybe? The only problem was that the U-2 wreckage had been found relatively intact, and it contained sophisticated reconnaissance equipment designed to take high-resolution photographs of military bases and other strategic sites, all from altitudes of 70,000 feet. Additionally, weathermen don't usually carry a poison-laced suicide device around their necks, just in case they crash. Do they? Powers, a former captain in the U.S. Air Force and a veteran of numerous other top-secret operations, was convicted of espionage and sentenced to 10 years in a Russian prison and labor camp. Although he was freed two years later as part of a prisoner swap, the event caused a considerable escalation of Cold War tensions. Later, Powers' son, Gary Jr., founded the Cold War Museum in Warrington, Virginia. Number 7. The Bay of Pigs 
President John F. Kennedy faced his first serious test as commander-in-chief only a few months after taking office. A paramilitary unit of Cuban exiles, trained and financed by the CIA, planned to invade Cuba in the spring of 1961 and topple the pro-Soviet communist government of Fidel Castro. The operation had been initially greenlit by then-President Dwight D. Eisenhower with hopes that the invaders would trigger a counter-revolutionary uprising across the island nation. It didn't. In fact, everything that could have gone wrong did just that along the south coast of Cuba in an area called the Bay of Pigs, where 17th century pirates had once hunted wild pigs. At the core of the fiasco, the rebels never really had much of a chance of succeeding. Castro had proven himself a popular and an effective military strategist. Two years earlier, he'd led a spirited revolution to overthrow General Batista, a corrupt dictator propped up by Washington to protect U.S. corporate interests. Kennedy, fearing international blowback for being an imperialist aggressor, as well as not wanting to poke the Russian bear, reluctantly allowed the plan to move forward as long as no American soldiers were directly involved. He also scratched air cover in the last minute, a move that all but sealed the fate of the doomed mission. After landing ashore at dawn on April 17, 1961, Brigade 2506 quickly realized they were no match for Castro's well-organized revolutionary armed forces. After all, the men and women of Cuba were battle-tested and they were confident, having fought for two and a half years during the Cuban Revolution. Furthermore, Castro's arsenal now included Soviet T-34 tanks, tank destroyers, and anti-aircraft artillery. The end result proved to be a complete disaster for the insurgents, the majority of whom would be taken as prisoner, killed. Or wounded. The one-sided affair dealt the U.S. a humiliating defeat and set the stage for a major mano a mano showdown with the Soviet Union in the months to come. Number six: Cuban Missile Crisis. On the morning of October 16, 1962, National Security Advisor McGeorge Bundy alerted President Kennedy of an emerging situation brewing 90 miles off the coast of Florida. Two days earlier, a U.S. military surveillance plane captured hundreds of aerial photographs revealing a Soviet missile base under construction near San Cristobal in Cuba. What transpired over the next 13 days became the most harrowing encounter of the Cold War, a crisis that would not only define the Kennedy legacy, but bring the world to the brink of nuclear war. The threat of a Soviet ICBM strike hitting American soil rapidly turned into a frighteningly real possibility. Over the next two weeks, Kennedy huddled with senior White House officials, including Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara and members of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, to discuss his military options. The debate centered around whether to invade Cuba, launch airstrikes, or push for a diplomatic solution. On day eight, Kennedy ordered a naval blockade in the Caribbean and placed all U.S. military forces at DEFCON 3, which is increased readiness. As Soviet ships and submarines sped towards the quarantine line, Khrushchev relayed orders for them to hold their positions temporarily. Meanwhile, additional reconnaissance photos confirmed the presence of Soviet MiGs at air bases in Cuba, and this only heightened the mounting tension. In the next 48 hours, fear and anxiety became palpable. Atheists found religion, and American armed forces reached DEFCON 2, the highest in U.S. history. Khrushchev then issued a pair of letters stating that the Soviets would remove their missiles if the U.S. publicly guaranteed not to invade Cuba and that the U.S. remove its missiles from Turkey. Finally, on the 13th day, the two sides relented and settled on an agreement. Years later, McNamara shed light on the story, underscoring just how close nuclear war was. While on patrol during the blockade, a U.S. Navy destroyer, the USS Beale, dropped warning depth charges on top of a Soviet submarine armed with a 15 kiloton nuclear torpedo. Unable to make radio contact with its base, a heated argument ensued among the sub's three ranking officers about whether to go to the surface or go on the attack. Fortunately, for the sake of humanity, cooler heads prevailed, and the rest, as they say, is history. Number 5. Sputnik 1 Sputnik. Despite its funny-sounding name, most Americans saw little humor in the Soviet Union's launch of Earth's first artificial satellite on October 4, 1957. The United States had been caught by surprise, assuming they held the inside track on advanced rocket technology. Indeed, its stellar team of scientists included legendary ex-Nazi Werner von Braun, who helped Germany develop the world's first long-range guided ballistic missile. But with the launch of Sputnik 1, the Soviets took the early lead in what became known as the space race. In addition to the initial shock as well as a bruised ego, the U.S. had to act fast in order to keep up with their rival's accelerated program. President Eisenhower called it the Sputnik Crisis, and citizens from coast to coast became gripped with paranoia. They were wondering what exactly this chunk of metal overhead meant for the future of life on Earth. A few months later, concerns became further magnified when the American Vanguard TV-3 satellite mission only managed to get four feet off the ground before exploding, a stinging failure dubbed Flopnik and Kaputnik. 
The Soviets also claimed bragging rights for putting the first animal, man, and woman in space on subsequent missions. Eventually, the US would hit its stride and prove that it had the right stuff after all. Eight years after President Kennedy famously declared that the US would put a man on the moon, Apollo 11 accomplished the historic feat, with astronaut Neil Armstrong declaring, "...that's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind." Number 4. Chilean Coup d'etat after becoming president of Chile in a democratically held election, Salvador Allende soon faced a much bigger opponent, Uncle Sam. The Nixon administration, along with the CIA, viewed the Marxist leader as a grave threat and feared radical leftist governments would take root throughout South America. The Americans' well-funded covert operation worked to methodically destabilize Allende's government and cripple his country's economy. Moreover, the U.S. cultivated a coup d'etat by the Chilean military, adhering to the anti-communist rally cry of better dead than red. On September 11, 1973, armed forces attacked La Moneda, the presidential palace in Santiago, with tanks, infantry, and fighter jets. Allende escaped the initial wave, but later committed suicide with an automatic rifle given to him by Fidel Castro. The victors established a military junta immediately afterwards and installed General Augusto Pinochet, who proclaimed himself Supreme Chief of the Nation. Pinochet, he later changed his name to El Presidente, would rule his Andean fiefdom for the next 17 years, a dark period marked by brutality and murder, making Idi Amin look like Nelson Mandela. During his reign of terror, Pinochet ordered the execution of more than 3,000 political opponents, as well as the torture and imprisonment of tens of thousands of Chileans. His secret police committed a wide variety of abuses at the notorious Villa Grimaldi complex, a house of horrors that probably warrants a grisly top 10 video of its own. Number 3. The Soviet Invasion of Afghanistan by the early 1970s, Cold War troubles began to slightly ease following the historic sit-down between President Richard Nixon and Soviet leader Leonid Brezhnev that produced a peace treaty known as SALT strategic arms limitation talks. But the short-lived goodwill between the two superpowers later turned salty when the USSR invaded Afghanistan in December of 1979. Soviet tanks rolled into the Eurasian country in response to anti-communist Muslim guerrillas called the Mujahideen, those who engage in jihad, and their attack on the Afghan's pro-Soviet government. The US quickly condemned the act of aggression and countered with an ambitious covert plan called Operation Cyclone, providing substantial financial aid and arms to the rebels. The nasty conflict eventually lasted nine years and has been characterized by many historians as the Soviet Union's version of the Vietnam War. Afghanistan, a landlocked, mountainous nation known for its extreme weather, fierce fighters, and supplying 90% of the world's heroin, boasts a long history of dispatching foreign invaders. In fact, the territory is known as the Graveyard of Empires and has never been completely conquered, an impressive streak dating back to Alexander the Great. Not surprisingly, the Soviets found themselves trapped in a costly quagmire, resulting in the death of over 14,000 soldiers, with 50,000 being wounded. The nearly decade-long war also saw hundreds of thousands of Afghan civilians killed and millions more flee their homeland, primarily to Pakistan and Iran. For their part, the US paid a steep price as well. Operation Cyclone would go down as one of the longest and most expensive CIA operations in its long and spooky history. On the one hand, the concerted effort helped draw the USSR into a protracted and expensive war that ultimately hastened their demise. However, the impact created further instability to an already volatile region. Consequently, this indirectly led to the disastrous rise of global Islamic terrorism, including Osama bin Laden's development of al-Qaeda. Number 2. Olympic Boycotts the war in Afghanistan prompted U.S. President Jimmy Carter to boycott the 1980 Olympic Games in Moscow. This led to reciprocal action four years later, when the USSR and other Eastern Bloc countries, as well as their allies, refused to compete in the Games in Los Angeles. Over the years, the heralded athletic competition has seen its share of protests, providing a platform for various political causes and declarations, from the iconic raised fists of Tommy Smith and John Carlos in 1968 to the tragic murder of 11 Israeli team members by Palestinian terrorists in 1972. Adolf Hitler also used the 1936 games as a way to promote his idea of Aryan race supremacy. Under the Fuhrer, the Germans also pioneered the development of steroids and other performance-enhancing drugs. Jesse Owens aside, the home team easily won the Lions' share of medals across the board. It's worth noting that the boycotts of the 1980s resulted in countless missed opportunities for athletes whose shot at Olympic glory only comes around every four years. Deck athlete Bob Kaufman is just one of many examples of someone poised for greatness, only to wind up as a rather sad anecdote in a video about the Cold War. Leading up to the games, Kaufman had been ranked number one in the world in the grueling ten-event decathlon. He had trained countless hours for his chance to immortality. That day, it never arrived, underscoring the randomness of fate which relegates some into obscurity, while others are allowed to grace the box of Wheaties and become a Kardashian. Number 1. Fall of the Berlin Wall 
By the late 1980s, and after four decades of Cold War feuds, the USSR could no longer sustain themselves economically. Mikhail Gorbachev, a decidedly more progressive Soviet leader than his hardline predecessors, attempted to save his crumbling nation by allowing democracy to gradually take hold in satellite regimes, including the communist stronghold of East Germany. The Berlin Wall, a long-standing ideological symbol of division both literally and figuratively, would become the centerpiece that ended the Iron Curtain's dominance, and was punctuated by US President Ronald Reagan's demands of, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. In post-war Germany, the country had been split into four occupation zones controlled by the United States, Britain, France, and the Soviet Union. In 1961, the communist government of East Germany began constructing a barbed wire and concrete wall. This was primarily to stem the mass number of defections of its citizens to the West. The makeshift barrier eventually became a 12-foot-high, 4-feet-wide fortress of reinforced concrete stretching nearly 100 miles. The wall was incredibly hard to get past. Berlin's version featured a death strip consisting of soft sand, floodlights, attack dogs, tripwire machine guns, and itchy-fingered soldiers with orders to shoot on sight. Additionally, the DDR established 12 checkpoints, including the infamous Checkpoint Charlie in the American sector, and that's the scene of some of the most iconic images of the wall. On November 9, 1989, East German officials announced that the border was officially free to cross with impunity. A mass crowd of people gathered at the wall, and it soon turned into an unbridled celebration as revelers used hammers and picks to tear down the wall. They would later be joined by bulldozers and earth movers paving the way for the eventual reunification of Germany in 1990. Although the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991, sadly the Cold War never really ended. It just stalled a bit. And when a former KGB officer named Vladimir Putin got himself elected as president of Russia with an impressive 110% of the vote, he quickly served notice that the big bad bear was back. No word yet from Las Vegas odds makers on who's the favorite to win, but smart money knows that intelligence trumps ignorance every single time. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, give us a thumbs up below. Lots of people in this video that we've done biographies on on my other channel, Biographics, so check that out. There's a link below. Why not subscribe? And as always, thank you for watching.